Well, it being the noon hour here in New York City, I want to welcome everyone and wish you a, either a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're viewing this Zoom uh, roundtable. This is, I think, our third Helix Center roundtable that we've, um, for which we've relied on the Zoom uh, format. And of course, that's due to the COVID uh, pandemic. We're trying to do the best we can and make the best of it. And I think so far, these Zoom meetings have been quite lively and interesting. So before I tell you about today's uh, roundtable, I want to make just two very brief announcements. And those relate to our upcoming uh, roundtables. Uh, scheduled for March 20th, we will have a roundtable on placebo and the placebo and nocebo effects. That should be very interesting. And then uh, either on April 17th or 24th, to be determined, we're going to have a talk on stress. And right now we're not stressing out about what, which date it is exactly, but uh, we'll, we should be able to have that nailed down shortly. Today we have a really wonderful panel of discussants convened to discuss this topic of populism. And uh, before I get things underway, I wanna just say a word, a brief word about each of our discussants. And in the interest of, of equity, I'm gonna do this in uh, alphabetical order. Um, Jeffrey Alexander is the Lillian Shavinson Saden Professor of Sociology at Yale University, founder and co-director of Yale's Center for Cultural Sociology and co-editor of the American Journal of Cultural Sociology. A social theorist whose early work challenged the anti-cultural reductionism of classical and modern sociology, Alexander has worked with generations of students and colleagues to create a, quote, strong program, unquote, in cultural sociology. Um, Alexander has also developed the civil, civil sphere theory, a macro sociological model of democracy and the forces that can undermine it. He is currently organizing a series of conferences and edited a book project, The Civil Sphere in Latin America, The Civil Sphere in East Asia, Bridging the Civil Order, Radicalism in Civil Sphere. Dhananjay Jagannathan is a, a philosophy professor and also classical studies professor at Columbia University. His academic research centers on Aristotle's ethics and political philosophy and contemporary virtue ethics. He's also written about issues at the intersection of philosophy and literature, including on tragedy and the novel. At present, he is completing a book manuscript entitled Aristotle's Practical Epistemology, which seeks to situate Aristotle's theory of practical wisdom within his views of knowledge and understanding, and thereby to explain why Aristotle thinks of practical wisdom as an extraordinary achievement that is equivalent to political wisdom. Takas Pappas is a, uh, has a PhD from Yale in political science. He's a Greek author and researcher currently associated with the University of Helsinki in Finland. Formerly a professor of comparative politics at the University of Thessalonica in Greece. He's also held teaching and research appointments at the universities of Strasbourg, Oslo, Freiburg, Luxembourg, Central Europe University in Budapest, European University in Florence, Yale, and Princeton. Among his books are Making Democracy, I'm sorry, Making Party Democracy in Greece, The Charismatic Party, and Populism and Crisis Politics in Greece. And lastly, Harry L. Watson. He is an, the Atlanta Distinguished Professor in Southern Culture in the History Department of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. A native of Greensboro, North Carolina, he received his bachelor's degree from Brown University and his doctorate from Northwestern before joining the UNC History Department in 1976. His teaching and research interests focus on American political history, the early American Republic, and the antebellum South. He served as director of the UNC Center for the Study of American South from 1999 until 2012, and an editor of its journal, Southern Culture, from 93 to 2019. He is the author or editor of eight books, including Andrew Jackson versus Henry Clay, 
Democracy and Development in Antebellum America, Liberty and Power, The Politics of Jacksonian America, and Building the American Republic, A Narrative History to 1877. Okay, therewith, I'm going to uh, open up our conversation by asking each of our discussants to make some comments about how they define populism. And um, I want to make it clear at the outset that I think everyone will agree that the term populism is not something that has an exact and precise definition, but is something that we all at some point seem to be wrapping our minds around. And then especially recently with the developments in uh, our modern history, I think it's become a very hot topic. So I throw it open. Um, who wants to take a, a quick shot at just making a quick definition so we can get things underway? Well, I don't mind sticking my neck out if I if I may, if everybody else is going to be shy. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate. This, uh, I look forward to this as being very interesting. It seems to me that uh, you're very right to stress that populism is a, a fuzzy category, but it seems to me almost always to refer to a, a mass movement, usually a mass political movement, but not always, uh, of uh, a large group of people who define themselves as simply the people, um, uh, usually not subdivided uh, further than that. Uh, they usually have a grievance against elites whom they feel have deserved them and who ought not to, who's, uh, who are there to serve the people but have not. Uh, and uh, the people are asked to uh, replace, overthrow, displace these elites and, and govern more directly themselves. Sometimes the people also define themselves against a subordinate group whom they regard as, as uh, also undeserving and who uh, perhaps are allies of, of elites who uh, are working uh, from both ends, as it were, against the people. Yeah, I, I think I, I can endorse quite a lot of that. What I want to add is I, I think something that distinguishes um, a lot of populist movements is that um, it's not just that they want to define uh, a group of people as the people, um, but also that the people are a kind of repository for certain kinds of qualities um, that are underappreciated by that elite that, that the people are defined in relation to. So I think, you know, coming from a kind of classical perspective, uh, populist movements, you might say, appeal to the virtues that the masses possessed that are not commonly recognized and that um, it's, it's a, a reaction to a construal of the people as lacking those virtues and deserving only secondary forms of political or social participation. I'd go with that. Can we begin talking like without? Please. Yeah. Uh, so I will go next. And I beg to differ here because I do not believe that populism is a fuzzy category. And I think that we can arrive at exact and precise definitions uh, of that. But before that, let me, let me, let me take a different approach here. Uh, my, my concern is when we talk about populism is why do we care about populism and why do we care about it now? And I think that there are, we're talking about modern populism here. Of course, there have been populist phenomena in history from, you know, from the Greek demagogues, for example, to the Roman Republic and all the way down to our own days, right? But we're talking about modern populism now. So what is very interesting about populism and about our concern about populism is that first it is a novelty. It is a new phenomenon that emerges in the aftermath of World War II in the liberal democracies that developed after the end of World War II. Secondly, it is a geographically diffused phenomenon. We see that firstly in Latin America, then it comes into Europe in the late 70s, and then it expands to the United States. Thirdly, it is a very ambivalent phenomenon. We have left-wing populism 
and right-wing populism. And sometimes they come together very nicely and neatly, like, like it happened in my country a few years ago. And finally, the fourth factor that, that makes populism such an intriguing phenomenon is that it has a strong impulse for autocracy. Although populist leaders come into power by the ballot box, okay, it has a very, very strong impulse for authoritarianism, for autocracy. We saw that in the United States quite recently. Now, all of those four factors lead us to a very, very simple definition. If we put them together, and my definition has two words. It is the most minimal definition you can get around. There's nothing more minimal than that. So I define populism in my work. I've been here in this area for many, many years, actually working on populism and democracy, liberal democracy. So I define that as democratic liberalism. So it is a system, it is a political party or parties or a, or a system or a leader, if you like, any kind of level of unit of analysis that abides by the rules of democracy, but not by the rules of post-war liberal democracy. It is a democratic, illiberal kind of rule. And I will leave it here for the moment. Liberal, illiberal democracy then, illiberal democracy, a democracy that is not liberal. By the I way, this like is the definition um... used by Vic Victor Orban. Yeah. I, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, people wouldn't agree with Orban's definition, but I think I don't think there's anything to argue with any of these definitions. But what I would, and people who are listening to this podcast have to realize that this word is a fuzzy concept, and anybody who says that it they have a precise definition is just taking a position in the field of discussion. And that definition will stand for certain other associated uh, positions. I would like to argue, I would like to add on to these, I don't have any disagreement that with a few cautions, one, populism isn't a post-war phenomenon that it goes back to. Certainly, it's endemic to, um, in fact, it's endemic to a, a Republican idea of democracy. It's, it's, it's a theme, it's a dimension, and it's a strain. Why is it a strain? Because uh, a democracy, let's just call it, uh, always, always has a reference to the people. It always has a presupposition that there is a civil community regulated by law and that the people vote and, and uh, uh, elect somebody. So you're never going to have a democratic process, even if it's a relatively elite, elitist 18th century process or something more incorporative like the one we have now that doesn't have continuous references to the people. The people should rule. I'm, this movement is on behalf of the people, et cetera. Obama, who's not, not a populist, had populist dimensions. Uh, he talked constantly about the people. The other thing is I'd say that there's a continuum of populism, therefore, that moves from within uh, the institutions of democracy to beyond to what I call radical populism, which breaks then the uh, the institutions and results in one man or one woman rule on the left or the right. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, I certainly agree with the idea that, that there's a kind of endemic feature that, um, especially in Republican politics, because, you know, lowercase r Republican politics has this internal tension, and you can see populism as one kind of way that that tension comes to the surface. Uh, I think as one of the prompts for this, for this panel, we got this quote um, from either Madison or Hamilton from the Federalist Papers about how even if every Athenian citizen had been a Socrates, a group of them would still have been a mob. And this idea that when you, you know, for Republican politics to work, you need a suitable number of people who are fit to the task of governing but who in governing represent, in some sense, the will of the people and are accountable to them. 
but whom the people as a whole see as better than them. And that particular intrinsically elite dimension of, of Republican forms of democracy is, I think, unpopular <laughs> in the 20th century, the 21st century. Uh, it's, it's no longer seen as appropriate to regard the political elite as superior in virtue or in decision making or anything like that. Um, and as a result, I think that, you know, that explains why, why populist movements have emerged. It's a kind of suspicion of this idea of a, of a governing elite who would, you know, are better at the job than, than the rest of us. Um, but, you know, we, we, we can see other circumstances in which you know, these kinds of suspicions have, have broken forth in the past where elites have not done a good job of, of maintaining the illusion, let's say at least, of, of governing well or of representing the will of the people or remaining accountable to them. So I do think it's kind of intrinsic to Republican politics because it has this combination of popular, a popular basis uh, and uh, the establishment of a governing class. I'd like to endorse that. Um, I think that's very well put. Um, and my perspective as, a, as an American historian um, focuses my attention, I, I guess, so I, I'm less familiar with some of the um, uh, other examples. But if we restrict populism to the post-World War II period, it leaves out the biggest episode uh, in American history that's been labeled as populist ever since it happened. And that was the uh, uprising of the, or the emergence and of the so-called People's Party of the uh, 1890s. Uh, and I think going back, uh, there have been uh, several um, uh, conspicuous occasions in uh, American history, again, where uh, movements have appeared that say um, the people have uh, inherently more virtue than the uh, elites. Uh, and while it's true that virtue is essential to Republican government, we the people have more of it than those stuffed shirts at the top. And uh, we demand that they be displaced and uh, replaced uh, by people who are more authentic uh, representatives of our will. Uh, I think that was very much a characteristic of Andrew Jackson's political movement. Uh, I think they're going back uh, into episodes like the, the Whiskey Rebellion or the North Carolina Regulation, even in colonial period at times, uh, there have been mass movements with populist features uh, like that. And I think that's one of the benefits of calling it, a, uh, of using a fuzzy dis definition, because you can um, uh, legitimately talk about a movement with populist features without getting utterly bogged down into whether it fits this box exactly or that one. Okay, let me try link some dots here, if I may. Do we care about populism as historians? That would be fine, of course. And populism has been there, out there in history, since immemorial times. I mean, all societies have been divided between elites and the people, right? If you go back to the Roman Republic, for example, you even find the party that is called the Populares. Uh, that was the party that went against the Senate, against the Optimates. Right? And uh, the, the, the tribunes of the plebs, like Tiberius Gracchus, for example, and his brother Gaius Gracchus were populist leaders. And this is why they were assassinated, because they went against the Senate, against the elites of that time. And if you go all the way up to today, you find many, many populist movements. I mean, no one doubts about that. And when it comes to the United States, Michael Kazan has written a marvelous book about, about populism in, in the United States since the 19th century. But and of course, Jackson was a populist leader. I mean, he was divisive. He was the one who relied on the spoiled system. And those are phenomena that we see in, in contemporary populism galore. I mean, polarization, patronage politics, etc. But it's not the reason. I mean, we're not historians. I mean, we, I mean, we, we care about populism because Wait a minute. it I affects. Am. <laughs> yes, you are. You are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, yes. Uh, I mean. We, the people, the <laughs> ordinary people, okay, we are not historians like, you know, uh, like you. Now, it affects our lives. I mean, this is why there is this, this booming thing about, uh, since 2016, actually, about populism. Because populism 
and populist governments affect our lives. And this, this stands on two puzzles. This presents us with two puzzles. First, how, how comes that populism emerges? In recent times, in our liberal democracies, we used to live in liberal democracies. Now, something is happening here. We see all of those guys who are not liberal. Punto, period. Yeah. What do we do with that? How can we deal with that? And secondly, what would populism, if successful as it sometimes is, how does it do to liberal democracies? How can people like uh, Chavez, uh, Orban, uh, uh, Trump, etc., cetera, how, what can they do to our lives, to our liberal democracies? So this is why I focus on the modern times because I'm not a historian, first of all, and secondly, because I care about the future, my future and my children's future. I want, I, I, yeah, I want, can I respond ahead. to that? Please, yeah, I, I think, yeah. you know, one of the things that a historical perspective offers you is alternatives to liberal democracy. I mean, it, I think it depends a little bit on how optimistic or pessimistic you are about the liberal project in the post-World War II period. And if you feel that there are, there are, you know, that the, for instance, the rise in economic inequality over the last 50 years is, is a, um, you know, it's a feature, not a bug of the liberal order. Um, it's a consequence of the concentration of certain kinds of power in the hands of some people, then you might not be so optimistic about thinking, well, what we need to do is to get back to that. I, I'm very suspicious of golden age thinking, whether it's uh, looking back to the 17th century or looking back to the 1950s. And you know, if there are vulnerabilities in, in our form of life, our form of political life, then looking to, the, to some of the alternatives and think, thinking in historical terms can give you, give you perspective. And I think this, this applies you know, e e even when you're thinking sort of cross-constitutionally. Uh, I find it very illuminating to think about the Gracchi and, the la and their land reforms when I'm trying to understand what Narendra Modi is up to, you know, it, you know, how he came to power on the back of, of the struggles of ordinary farmers in India and, and the kind of land reforms that he's, he's put into place. Monty, Monty is not the tribune of the plebs. Monty is the prime minister. So he's the Senate. Yeah. But he is if you want to draw the analogy. Go ahead, Jeff. I mean, I think that most of the populism that people are afraid of, most but not all, uh, is, is populism of the extreme right today. There are some exceptions, uh, like uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador in Mexico. Uh, but the, the fear, the ones that move to the right usually combine an anti-elitist uh, movement on behalf of the people with, with a deep personalism. Well, that's, that's part of populism on the left, extreme left. But also with uh, bigotry and uh, uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Islamism, some kind of uh, anti-civil discourse that targets not just an elite. I think some, one of you referred to that earlier, but another group uh, that as, as a tremendous danger. So that the country that they or the people that they want to set up are... Uh, ethnically homogeneous group. The left populist is not as concerned usually with that, uh, but thinks more in terms of the class so that there's a pure class that they will represent and they'll come to power. And th But they're also just as dangerous because they will then possibly, well, eliminate members of all the other classes that they, the people don't represent. I was um, interested in this reference to virtue, because um, of course virtue is also. I don't, you know, I, I don't want to say it's. I, I don't want to keep repre repeating that it's a fuzzy category, but it's certainly not something easily defined, or it could take tomes to define virtue, uh, and yet it seems to be an engine. The issue of virtue and who has it seems to be an engine uh, driving these conflicts, right? And I think similarly, there's the idea of. Well, who are the elites? Because I think elitism also has been changing over time. What exactly, who are those people? Just a moment, just a moment. I mean, populism comes into power quite often. I mean, it has happened in many, many places, not only with left-wing populists like in Venezuela, for example. Think about Chavez and Maduro. Uh, think about my little country, Greece. We have had our share of left populism. 
uh, for many, many years under Papandreou and under Tsipras more recently, or under you know, right-wing governments. Now, what happens here is when they come into power, they become the elites. How do we deal with that? I mean, populists have been in power in several countries for many, many years. They are the elites. It is, it is very simple or simplistic to say that those are against the elites because they do become the elites. Think about Trump. Think about Orban. He has been in power since 2010, 11 years now. First, secondly, if I may, uh, left-wing populists and right-wing populists, I, 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 I alluded to that earlier, often come, they form a tandem and they rule together. This happened again in my country in 2015 until 2019 for four years, full years, uh, a, a populist party, Syriza, and a right-wing party, extreme right-wing party, nativist party, the independent Greeks ruled together, no problem there. Or think about Peronism in Argentina. I mean, Peron was a right-winger. And today, the Peronist party, the Justicialist party, is a left-wing party under the Kirchner. Madame Kirchner, father, uh, husband has died. So, it is not that, you know, simple. No. So those but it's also, are, you're making it simple by, by arguing that left and right are the same. This is a common argument of people who attack populism, which is, well, you know, there's no real difference between the left populism and the right. In fact, there's a great deal of difference. I mean, going back to what Donna Jay said, you know, if there are vast structural uh, inequalities in a country that has a democratic form of government, there have to be and there, there should be uh, constant movements to overthrow uh, the people who have privileges or to restructure the society. Now, as long as you have democratic institutions, that's not going to end up in an, an anti-democratic form of power. It will be metabolized in various ways. But these populist threads, I think, throb through the history of all stratified societies that have democratic forms of government. Actually, I want to say I want to say something that, that might be surprising given what I said earlier, which is that I actually, you know, I think in our contemporary global context, I, I want to endorse what Taka said about the the contrast between populism and liberalism, because I think that is the most that is the most illuminating uh, pairing of phenomena. Um, but I, I think you know one one way in which the I mean there are left liberals and right liberals, and I think this helps us get some clarity on the differences in the origins of of left wing and right wing populism. And in particular, I think there are different kinds of elites uh, or, or phenomena of elite capture that, that drive populist movements. And this might be one of the reasons there's overlap between the left and the right, because it's not all economic. If it were just about economic elites and a corresponding sort of class critique, then we would, we would not expect left and right wing populism to overlap. But in addition to economic elites or phenomena of economic inequality, there's also, I think, political and cultural phenomena so I think this is especially true in the United States context where um, economic, political, and cultural capital come apart in very visible ways. You can think about Wall Street, K Street, and Hollywood as kind of the totemic you know, things to pin, pin this on. So you know, as has been documented extensively, especially in recent years, you know, we have this phenomenon of stagnation of wages and rising economic inequality in this country. But the government, I think, related to that but separate conceptually separate from it is the fact that our government institutions are increasingly responsive to certain kinds of private interests. And people don't feel like they have the possibility of political accountability, and that's for a wide range of reasons, including our campaigns, our electoral system and our campaign finance system, lots of other reasons. Those are the things that I care about the most. But um, And then there's a kind of phenomenon of cultural elitism, where you know uh, I think we've lost a kind of mass culture that we ha have had in, in the past in various ways, uh, which helped to unite people across different kinds of social strata. And um, you know, there's a kind of, um, there's a sort of pluralism, a form of cultural pluralism that has taken hold in elite institutions like universities that many of us are affiliated with, uh, the media, certain other kinds of institutions um, that I would call a pluralism without aspiration it says that um, uh, people are essentially different from each other, 
and we don't have any common values around which to unite. And you have to accept these essential differences and not try to and not try to um, make common cause with people across those differences. Um, and I think that that particular cultural phenomenon has has driven a kind of uh, popular insurgency in the United States that crosses the left right wing distinction. Um, whereas I think when it comes to the economic issues and I think to some extent the political issues, that's been much more polarized. And you know I think those things stand much more behind the success of someone like Bernie Sanders in Democratic Party politics um, than it does explain the rise of Donald Trump. But uh, and, you know, famously it was documented that in the 2016 election, you know, people who, who actually were at the bottom of the economic uh, poll uh, went for Clinton over Trump by some extent, which put the lie to the idea that this is an economic uh, populism that was really driving the Trump phenomenon. Um, so I, you know, I, think, I think because of this sort of plurality of, of forms of elite, elitism or elites and the ways that these come apart, you know, I think you actually have over, overlapping populist energies that can get sucked into different forms of populism across the political spectrum. Um, John Rawls had written in uh, Law, Laws of People that um, liberal democracies had a um, sort of, let's say, I'd call it a homeostatic principle where uh, liberal uh, people educated in liberal democracies grew to value uh, the democratic process so much so that they would not allow it to slip back into tyranny. And uh, I think latter-day developments and developments in history sort of put the light to that approach that's perhaps overly optimistic. Well, I, I think if you've got democratic forms that uh, have created results that are, are profoundly uh, alienating, disillusioning, uh, in grieving uh, to uh, those who define themselves as the people, then they may decide that uh, those democratic forms uh, are the source of their their uh, deprivation and, and may turn against those. So uh, I, I think we all recognize that democracy is a lot more fragile than maybe uh, Professor Rawls um, appreciated at the time he was writing it. I mean, I, I think let me that jump on that we have to realize. And why don't we let Takas first? Because I think his his feed delay kind of got him behind the behind the eight ball. Go ahead, Takas. No, I'm fine. I mean, I mean. About let us see how I mean let us see how, how it works, how populism works. So what we have in the beginning, that's the situation of nature. You have a liberal democracy. What is a liberal democracy, right? A liberal democracy is a system that acknowledges that there are many divisions in society, class divisions, cultural divisions. So again, I'm trying to link the dots. Uh, regional divisions, religious divisions, you name it, right? Now, Rawls comes and says, hey guys, let us play moderately. Let us know what he calls over, uh, overlapping consensus. He uses this phrase, overlapping consensus. How do we do that? By applying the rule of law and protecting the rights of minorities. Now, this is liberal democracy. This is what we have. Now, a guy comes, okay, and he says, because it is always a he, by the way, but I don't want to get into that. He says, no, 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 no. Democracies, I mean, our societies are not divided by so many divisions. We have one, one overarching division, the people versus the elites. Therefore, we cannot build bridges. There will be polarization. Forget it. Yes, adversity, conflict. We have to fight against each other. How, who is going to win? We, why? Because we are the majority. We are the people. Okay, forget rule of law. Forget the protection of minority rights, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how you get Trump. And this is I, I just Trump just uh, I disagree with that. Five million voters. You have to realize so that this social movements that have that permeate our society. We disagree all the time. <laughs> I mean, Rawls is describing an idealized. He's a political theorist. He's a normative political theorist. He's not a sociologist. You can't, or a political, empirical so, social scientist. You can't convert Rawls's idea of into a empirical description 
of how democracy actually works in a in a in a in a in an actual society. So you can't criticize an actually existing society from the point of view of Rawls and say it doesn't work right. No. It what well, instead we have to think about how does it work? And I think it's fascinating to me that despite the the most radical right wing challenge in American history, which was Trump, because he took the presidency. Uh, the the structural differentiation of the United States, the op- set of office obligations of many office holders, the legal order, uh, other civil associations, and the institution of journalism as a profession, it contained this very dangerous populist movement. And so we can't just broadly talk about populism taking over countries. We have to think of them as movements, and then we need to think of institutions and other kinds of virtues. I, th- I think it's it's you know it is a it's a it's sort of a populism as a, as a stress test. I think is an interesting way of thinking about it. You know, insofar as mm-hmm. it's not just individuals who are singled out as the bad elites, but actually uh, institutions like the media, like universities. I mean, I would say the United States is passed the stress test a lot better than Hungary currently is, you know, given given the state of uh, sort of civil society institutions there. And, um, and it, you know, that might have to do with, with the, you know, the particular forms of uh, decentralization of power that are possible. And, and power thought of very broadly, not just as political power, but also as economic, cultural power. Um, you know, how many people know each other in certain kinds of political circles? And, you know, can, can a political party take over a media apparatus or not? It, those kinds of things depend on networks of affinity that are much harder to, to pull off in a country of 330 million people. Oh, no, I don't think that's exactly true. I mean, we have big countries like Brazil and, and Turkey. I think if you have a democracy for 200 years, and you have a gradual institutionalization of professions. I mean, most of the weak, the illiberal democracies, including uh, Greece, including Poland, including Hungary, including Brazil, are very recently established. They have very, very mm-hmm. fragile. Greece is not an illiberal democracy. No, it's not. But it has it has a very unstable democracy. It has had in the past. Your references to the right. I mean, it's um, no. Greek democracy is very stable. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, we. Had I a didn't say since now. I said, it is almost that, fifty years. In the scheme of things, that's not very long. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm <laughs> glad about it. But. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. No problem. No problem. I don't take that personally. Don't worry. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, democracy is right. I mean, the thing is that when a populist party comes into power, and this has happened in Greece, as I said earlier, I mean, I have lived through this. I mean, this is the story of my life, as a matter of fact. Uh, they sub. They, they weaken the institutions. And then another populist may come down the road, and then another one, and then you do not know what will happen to your democracy. And this is what happened in Republican Rome, by the way, after Tiberius Gracchus, we mentioned earlier. Uh, 60 years down the road, another guy came, a general called Marius, and another one called Scylla, and then Drusus, and then the Republic was gone. This is what we get. I mean, I cannot see how Hungary, for example, or Poland can go back to even weak liberalism. Yes, those are weak liberal democracies, but liberal have been in the past. This is what I'm saying. And Greece might go down the, that same road again. I, I know what you mean. I mean, I didn't mean to, uh, to disagree with you, but Democracy has been stable in Greece for a number of years, but the institutions are not that strong. Yes, I know what you mean, so I don't disagree with you at all. But it is exactly those feeble institutions that charismatic leaders, because there is charisma there, 
and there is agency, they may win power over and over again and lead those democracies to some authoritarian direction. That is the fear. So this populism is a, a deep tendency in, I would say, all societies. Uh, and it's counteracted by what? By deeply structured autonomous institutions committed to certain virtues that are run, that are deeply professionalized by strong civic traditions. Um, and, but that won't stop the, the populist impulse, right? And the populist impulse can be very productive if you have these institutions. It can lead to reforms, like like the working man's movement in the 19th century, or socialism being transformed into social democracy in the and the big welfare state in Western Europe. I and mean, these are very positive developments. But then you can have something like uh, you know the peasant movements in China and the workers and peasants movement in in Russia that end up creating dictatorships that last for a long, long, long time. They don't have populism, right? My, my, they, don't, they don't have populism. One point, I want, no, no, no. one point I want to make, and uh, I challenge here, is that I do not know in the modern world, again, any case in which anywhere in the liberal world, meaning the Americas, Europe, Canada, Australia, etc., Japan, any case in which populism has, has had positive outcomes, that, positive, that populism has been positive after being in power. Olivia? Anyway. Well, I, I honestly think that's one of the advantages of a historical mean, perspective, because it gives you a lot more examples um, of uh, populist movements that have been very beneficial. Uh, and I think the Working Men's Party in uh, the United States is a good example. I think the People's Party in the uh, 1890s was uh, a good example. I think we can all think of uh, revolutionary movements that um, looked uh, maybe pretty awful up close, but uh, had beneficial results over uh, a longer durée. Uh, so uh, I, let me uh, put in a plug for um, historical examples and a, and a historical perspective, because uh, I think that gives us uh, a much um, more complicated and nuanced view of what the poss possibilities are. Well, would, would there be yeah, a way to distinguish? I, said, I mean, I focus yeah. on modern populism. Yeah, yeah. Well, would there be a way to distinguish, <laughs> I know this is not likely, but, you know, good populist movements, like what is it that may be in a good populist movement that leads to reform versus one that seems to be what we use the words divisive, polarizing, et cetera. Well, I don't think polarization is necessarily bad. I mean, I, 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 right. I think, I think, I think polarization. The, 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 fr the fracturing of civil society is bad. And maybe that's a, that's a characteristic effect of long-term polarization. But if we think about, you know, um, corruption is, is obviously one phenomenon we can identify, you know, uh, it's it's possible for a mass movement to demand more accountability from political actors that re and economic actors, for that matter, that reduces corruption, and that's something that's quite measurable. Um, and you know, that, I would I would I would say that that's one phenomenon. Another, you know, the reason I brought up Bolivia is that um, uh, inequality has gone down, and of course, there are, I mean, you know, under Morales, who has ob obviously had authoritarian tendencies, uh, which you know we should think are bad. Um, to, to maintain power and to self-aggrandize in certain ways. Um, but, uh, you know, infrastructure spending is massively up. The, the, the welfare of, of people in rural poverty is, is massively up in Bolivia over that time frame. Now, you might think that's a, that's a happy accent of the resource extraction economy and, and, you know, sort of market prices and so on. There's disagreement to be had, but one interpretation of those events is that um, that was a situation in which, you know, it, this is especially a problem in petrostates. Um, or resource dependent states that that money gets tied up, you know, in the hands of a handful of people and does not get used to to bring people out of out of poverty. Um, of course, we can, you know, Norway is a petro state too, and they seem to do a pretty good job of taking care of people there. Um, 
and uh, you know you can you can see how resource extraction can be to the benefit of a, of a welfare state and to the to the to the welfare of the worst off people. Um, and I think you know there are different trajectories that that a populist movement can take. And I think Venezuela versus Bolivia is an interesting contrast because of the relatively similar time frames. I mean, Bolivia is a very unusual movement of left, a very unusual example of left populism. Radical, I mean, radical left populism staying within the tracks barely of, of dem democracy. And the recent elections, a great example of a populist being, re being elected again after an interim liberal. But I mean, what I'd like to ask the panel, like, what about the surging of, of black people's movements in the United States from the 1960s. That's a, a social movement and they call themselves the people acting on behalf of the people. I mean, they have charismatic leaders. How do you fit that in? I mean, there's this tendency to look at the issue as elites dominating or populism, but there's very positive social movements starting with the socialist or working people's movements in the 19th century that have, so I'd like, what, how, what do you deal with the mass movement against racial oppression? In, in the, how do you classify that in, in must, these terms? Mass movements are part of, you know, and they fit very well in the framework of a liberal democracy. I mean, those mass movements have to flourish. They may flourish. They may have their leaders as long, and they may act and produce their results as long as they abide by the rules of liberal democracy, by the institutions. There's yeah. nothing problem problematic about those those movements. I mean, what I, what uh, I would by say. By the way, let me say that Bolivia, Bolivia, Bolivia is not a good example. Because Bolivia is the only country in Latin America in which you have a, the, 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 the majority of the population is Indios. So if you don't take the racial issue, you cannot make sense of Bolivia. And you cannot compare Bolivia to any other country in Latin America and the world, actually. Because, and this is what uh, uh, Morales did. Morales was an Indio, right? So he rallied the support of his, uh, of his people, essentially. And he became president of Bolivia. And then the end was not very happy. It was a very unhappy end, but that was, I mean, Bolivia is not comparable because of the racial composition of the country. So let us leave Bolivia out. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's a bad case. Uh, it sounds like it's a case that doesn't fit your priors, and that's why it's a bad case. I think it's a very interesting no, illuminate, it's it a very illuminating case. Other... But anyway, I want to I respond to the I question think, about I black. Think I, I think I examined, I mean, I mean, I think I answered by, you know, uh, data. I mean, I'm giving you data. And uh, there is something that, that distinguishes uh, Bolivia, and this is race. Well, let me talk so about race in America for a moment. So I, I, think, I, I think I'm a comparative. I think the, the, 19, the 1963 March on Washington is a fantastic example of what the civil rights movement accomplished and what it didn't. You know, this is the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And in the writing of American history, the jobs part has dropped out. The minimum wage that is being debated in our, in our country now is roughly roughly corresponds to the minimum wage that was one of the main demands of that march. A two dollar minimum wage in 1963, which works out to something like 15 or 16 dollars, I think today, and and it didn't get passed. And in, in general, you know, people remember the "I Have a Dream" and the content of the character and, and things like that. And um, and that's been written into sort of American history, but not, not the economic demands. And, and you know, I think the, the profound failures of the labor movement, um, both through internal fracturing and through external pressures and the failure of the kind of regulatory apparatus on the government side, that is, that is one of the reasons for the continued massive gap in wealth between black Americans and other Americans. And, um, you know, one way of looking at that is that the civil rights movement was the beginning, you know, obviously guaranteeing civil rights is... In, in legislation and constitutions is, is crucial. Uh, but it was seen as only one piece of a larger uh, platform of changes to the material benefit of black people that have largely not been realized in the country. And I think from that perspective, it, you know, that, that, that I think is a huge stain. And I think um, there will be, you know, there's a, there's a continued opportunity in that front, on that front for, uh, multiracial coalitions of people within the labor movement and in other, in other venues in America. And I think there will be a kind of uh, resurgence of economic populism along those lines before too long. 
because it looks like the basically center-left and, and center-right policies of the Democratic and Republican parties are not sufficient to address those kinds of problems. Um, but that, what I was really asking is whether the black movements in the 20th century have, don't they have many of the elements of populism, not whether they're incompatible with liberal democracy. No, no, they, they, I, think, I think they absolutely did. And I think their economic dimensions yeah. are underplayed. So that's what I was suggesting is that uh, actually okay. seeing them as a, I think seeing, that, seeing that, that movement as an economic populist movement is really essential to understanding what it was. Yeah, exactly. And, and they also critique the white, even if you take the non-economic dimensions, they were a movement and are a movement against an elite. They call it the white elite. And just as the women's movement is, has been very, very anti-black uh, uh, male elites. It's been a mass movement of attack on, on, on male power. I mean, the Me Too movement. These are massive uprisings of, of people in a quote-unquote class that, that I regard as a part of this populist impulse that nobody would call them populist, though. Because they, they like them too much, or, or you know, many of the elites like them too much. Harry? Yeah. Well, I would say there, if, if I could interject just a moment, um, I think those are the, the women's movement or the civil rights movement are good examples of movements with populist features. But um, the, the um, race based civil rights movement cannot claim in the United States to represent the whole people because uh, African-Americans are, what, 20% of the population, 11% of the population in, in some counts. We've seen in recent years a uh, coalition uh, building efforts. Uh, so now you hear about black and brown people or uh, a, a broader or uh, uh, blacks, Latins, and, and uh, indigenous. Uh, and so there's, there's coalition building, but uh, nevertheless, the, the civil rights movement doesn't claim to represent the whole people. But it, uh, Jeffrey's absolutely right that it has very strong populist features. Uh, women's movement, um, the same way. The women's movement can represent half the people, but uh, not, um, not the whole people. Uh, so this, I think, is one of the benefits of fuzzy categories is you can say, uh, look at the populist features uh, of civil rights, look at the populist features of, of anti-sexism and um, make those kind of productive comparisons uh, without getting hung up on um, just exactly how well uh, they fit your Prior definition. Are these are these um, movements we're describing now to the degree they partake of populism as a as a driving force? Do they succeed to the degree that they um, also partake of some? They 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 moderate this sort of radical part of it. I mean, I think MLK is a good example of someone who sort of promised to white folks that he was not a radical, um, and I think. To some degree, that was helpful. I think abolitionists also a century earlier tried to make the case or win over the hearts of the rest of the country as a way to sort of spear. And some of them, of course, were quite radical. But um, uh, is it is that the case that the sort of moderating their I, I wouldn't go to the uh, to to the radicalism effort, but I would say that um, populist movements by like minority populist movements, if we can use that expression, succeed to the degree to which they can build a majority coalition by persuading people outside their base that, um, hey, I think that's just, or uh, I can see how our people would benefit from that also. So uh, the degree to which they can build coalitions um, for radical measures or unradical measures. But the, the point is uh, that they can um, move towards uh, a majority uh, in a democratic framework. Yeah, uh, I mean, I that the laws passed. I think that's a good point. I mean, the idea of a civil sphere or republic has the idea that there's a vital center. And if, if a populist movement moves too far to the right or the left, it says, I don't care. Oh, I think we have uh, we lost Jeff Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
who else wants to jump in? I mean, I want to I, I want to endorse that point. I, I think I think the the kind of stability uh, of the movement depends on coalition building in, in important ways, and um, but this, this, this is this is one of the puzzles is that yes, you set yourself up against the elite, and you might complain about the domination of certain kinds of institutions by the elite, <laughs> but do you want to get rid of the institutions themselves, or do you want to enervate them so fully that that they can't function? That's the point at which I think this starts to become sort of consumptive of the civil sphere or the Republican spheres. I think Jeffrey Jeff, was saying. Jeffrey, I think, well, you got when, free, when, I, I think you're freed up. You want to finish your thought? I'm not sure where, where I was cut off. It's hard to finish it when I didn't know <laughs> where I was. I was saying that, I mean, if a movement on the right or the left moves away and says, I give up on the vital center, I'm going to establish uh, a power simply on behalf of my own movement. So in that sense, black power uh, in terms of Black Panther, that was a populism. And they spoke of the people all the time, by the way. Uh, you know, so, and Trump, you know, as to the good point that Harry made, I mean, Trump spoke on behalf of the people all the time, but we know it was on behalf of only white people. His people, yeah. You know, his people, especially white people, and he left out. So this tension, you know, is always there, of course. Let me let me go back to social movements, if, if I may. Uh, when I went to school, we call them movements, and the whole field was called contentious politics. So there was there was back in the eighties, nineties, etc. The whole gamut of earth around that time, and they were were asking power essentially. And the most important of those movements was the Green Movement, of course. They created lots of parties in Europe. Some of those parties. Uh, form coalition governments. Some of those are in power even today uh, in a number of countries. Now, those movements are the gist and the essence of liberal democracy. We need those part, those movements because they do not go against the constitution. They want to change how politics works. They bring in new issues. Why do we call them populist? The, the, the word populist did not exist back then. I mean, we knew that Peron was a populist, but no one understood what the term meant. So those movements are always there, are a very essential part of democracy. They're not populist. They speak for particular uh, 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 electorates, constituencies, and that's that. There's what about the sort of about making them. some, laying some claim and to a, let me, a, yeah. I was going to say, what about laying some claim and let me just to a particular ask, kind of virtue? You know, uh, some particular sort of virtue based on their who they are as a people that that is a component of this these movements they are not there as 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 people they are there as carriers of particular interests they want or goals political goals aims they want a better you know a uh, uh, better climate uh, green development feminist movement for example I mean, they want to pursue the interests and the rights of the feminist movement, for example. And then let me ask something, the, the, the whole panel, because this is a very interesting question. I mean, this is the one of the elephants in the room. There's a number of elephants uh, when, when it comes to populism. What do we mean when we say the people? I mean, do we mean the nation, like, you know, make America great again? Do we mean the underprivileged strata all over the place, the poorer people, the ordinary people? Do we mean the, the, the working class, in which case we're in the Marxist domain, for example? Do we mean race, like in Bolivia? Do we mean uh, status, like in India? In India, for example, who are the people in India? Define the people. Well, according to Modi, it's yeah. Hindus. But it is an open question. <laughs> right, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward in some well, cases what, what, the, what the relevant form of populism is trading on. I mean, changing, changing the laws on citizenship is a, is, a, is a pretty clear move to define the people. I mean, if you want to look at a concrete political action, you know, the 2019 uh, Citizenship Act, uh, uh, you know, to, to make it impossible for large numbers of Muslims living in India to, to remain or, or become citizens. 
you know, th that that kind of religious test is is a pretty clear you know attempt to, to define the boundaries on, so on what sectarian you say is lines. So like the people does not exist. The people the people is made. The people does not exist. The people is made. Yep. It is a construction, <clears throat> right? I mean, Bourdieu talked about that. I mean, the making of the class. So you have a populist leader who makes his own people, and then he has his own clients who are going to vote for him, and he's going to stay there in power forever. And that's that. Enjoy. It's a, it's a function of uh, language to a degree to label some group. Uh, and it's interesting now, and I wanted to add, open up the conversation to incorporate information, the flow of information. We talked about, uh, you know, the free press and how that's important. And it's, uh, it's attacked by populist uh, leaders, demagogues anyway, um, is often a part of their game plan. Um, you know, labeling any group with any label, elite people, you know, uh, is a language game in a way, right? Um, but I wonder how much you all think information, uh, how it flows and who controls it has a, an effect on populism. I mean, I think this is, this is one of the, diff the differences in, in modern populist movements is now the attempt to bypass traditional media and use social media um, you know that that's that's one way of kind of doing and doing an end run. I think that's that's been proven to be pretty pretty successful worldwide in various cases. I mean, all movements depend on on filtering the reality for the people in the movement, so that it 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 recapitulates the the tenets of the movement. But every social movement for the last two hundred years has always had its own newspapers. Its own, its own. Uh, you know, you didn't need social media to have Hitler, uh, right? right? And yet, um, grasping a new form of communication is has been effective for populist movements, and not just in our lifetimes. Uh, in a early Republican society where communication was based on drawing room conversation. It suddenly introduced um, mass circulation newspapers and political rallies with uh, hundreds of people. Uh, uh, that's, that's a new form of com political communication and uh, it can be very effective. Uh, often populists are very innovative in their political techniques and uh, seizing new forms of political communication can be, um, you know, part of the part of the winning strategy. Or, well, but Obama was a was a campaigner and president who introduced oh, yeah. the digital revolution first. Yeah, and and you can you can see how you know you can have these features of populism without maybe being a full throated populist. And of course, populist leaders are very good at learning you know uh, these kinds of techniques and adapting them. And it it, it takes it takes time. And I think you know the 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 common thread is a kind of attempted direct communication unmediated by the kinds of traditional institutional actors. So instead of you know primary politics in America have changed dramatically in the last twenty five years. It used to be that. Um, you know, it was a very, is a hyper local sort of phenomenon, and you had to have the kind of grassroots organizing, which meant that you had to get hold of people. But going back to Howard Dean up to the present, you know, the internet has really changed that. The flow of money is, has changed, the flow of information has changed. There's been a kind of nationalization of, of party primaries, and that, that's really changed the influence of, of political parties and their ability to keep certain kinds of radical people out out of you know presidential primaries in the US. And I think that's that's a fascinating change. And lots of people are learning that lesson all across the political spectrum, all, sort of all at once. I, I would put that in a broader perspective because it is not only the the type of the medium, the type of the how how do they try to reach larger audiences and what do they do, the technique. It is that populist leaders, when they come into power, they try to silence the press that opposes the rule. So I would, I would put that in the broader framework of institutions, because what we see, the, 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 the playbook there, the populist playbook, is that when they take power, they attack the institutions, all of them. Press is one of them, freedom of the press. They attack the judiciary. Okay, they go against the courts. We saw that in America. We saw that in all other cases of populist rule. Okay, they uh, uh, they try to violate the division of powers. They try to control education. 
So they, they militate against institutions of liberal democracy, hence my definition of democratic liberalism. Okay. Uh, and this is very typical. I mean, there is not any case of populist rule that I happen to know that you do not see the same moves over and over again. It's like you know a playbook. And they do exactly the same thing. I think that the fact that we know there are uh, actors, um, China, uh, Russia in particular, who have made an effort to uh, redirect the conversation on or the ideas flowing through social media, that, that it's an important aspect of what we're seeing in modern uh, modern times. These are not democratic questions, though. Uh, I think right. we can start Neither with China the nor questions. Mm -hmm. Russia are democracies. Say that again, I'm sorry. That was... Repeat that. Takas, you repeat that. Okay. For some reason, I think he's. No, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, I didn't Go say ahead. anything. Okay. All right. Um, so I think the idea is we, we will open up um, the the uh, some of the questions that have come from the audience, and Alex uh, is here to help guide us through that. Yeah. Um, so if anyone wants to write more, there's only I only have one question so far. Well, I guess two from. Let's just stand up black through the Zoom. So if anyone has any questions, please write it in the Q&A part or on the chat and I'll relay it. Um, but yeah, so Susanna Black wrote um, something, I guess, based on what sort of Jeffrey had asked, which was, are contemporary race and sex focused progressive movements populist or anti populist? Can you speak to the distinction between class based left populism of the 2016 Bernie type? and contemporary progressive politics, which tend to center issues other than class and may tend in certain cases to reinforce existing institutional power, i.e. the phenomenon of woke capitalism. And then they wrote, alternatively, how can we do a better job in creating a common good politics that speaks to and includes all people in a polity as opposed to ontologizing the division or antagonism between the people and the elites? Is that possible or desirable? I mean, one, one thing that I was saying earlier, I think, responds to that, which is that, um, you know, there's different kinds of, different forms of pluralist politics. And, and one of them is sort of concerned with, say, the rect rectification of, of historical or present injustices and attempts to, you know, point to places where um, people cannot meet on an even footing in the public sphere as is desired by the principles of Republican politics. And I think, you know, we don't have a lot of talk about our Republican form of government anymore. Very, we spend very little time, you know, there's attention is paid to the eroding of our institutions or to certain kinds, you know, issues about, um, you know, dark money in our politics and so on. We don't talk very much about things like, we, well, citizens need certain kinds of virtues for our system of government to survive, the very things that you can see littered all over the Federalist Papers, as I mentioned at the beginning. And I think one result of that is that we get a kind of empty pluralist politics, which says uh, not taking into account whether people are subject to any form of injustice or meeting each other in an even playing field, that certain kinds of identities are uh, more important uh, than one's identity as a citizen uh, and uh, need to be sort of celebrated or valued in certain ways. And th to some extent, this is a kind of, this is fine because it, it might be pushing back against a homogenizing impulse that's also inappropriate in a large plural society. But unless it's framed with a certain set of aspirations about what we want to do together in, in civil society, uh, my fear is that it, 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 it tends to be more, uh, you know, to contribute to certain kinds of fracturing that make it impossible to have uh, broad coalition-based politics um, of, a, of a kind that, um, you know, is, is uh, in defense of our, of our common life. So that, that's, that's sort of my, my concern about what I call pluralism without aspiration or empty pluralism, that I think maybe certain, certain, certain strands of, of progressive politics point in this direction, not all of them. Um, and I think it's very easy to sort of paint different political movements uh, and dismiss them. Um, and I, I don't mean to be doing that, but that's the that's sort of reservation that I have. I'd really like to endorse that, uh, Don Jay, because um, you mentioned the Federalist Papers and the invocation to virtue over and over again. 
um, in the Federalist Papers, going past that word virtue um, to think about what um, uh, people in that era meant by the word virtue. When they were talking about public life, they meant virtue to them was the ability to set aside narrow personal self-interest and, and to advocate for the common good, however that might be defined. Um, and the pitfall there was that every pluralistic group tended to define the common good as their good, and it sort of uh, collapsed into um, brokerage liberalism. But um, if there were a way for us to recapture a vision of the common good or to advocate for a vision of the common good that would embrace more than um, uh, relatively small, certainly minority-sized slices of the population, uh, then I think we'd be um, taking a step in the right direction. One of the problems is that the word virtue is so hokey uh, these days that uh, anybody who stands up and tries to, to advocate for it kind of gets left I guess I guess we're supposed to say good character now or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. I mean, I, I disagree with both of you guys. I think that <laughs> virtues are completely at the heart of all, most of our public discourse today. And that the idea that we need to go back to an earlier, smaller form of republicanism based on you know, the Greeks or the founding fathers, it is, it's not right because virtues still are here. For example, when people say Trump was selfish and he only cared about himself, and then his opponents argued, we need somebody who cares about the whole society. That's, that's virtue talk. When, when somebody says people are dishonest, when they say they're corrupt, when they say that they're irrational or insane, that they don't have common sense. These are the, th this concern with virtue it permeates left, right, and center in, in all these democracies. So I don't think that the way to get a good society is, uh, is to say that we need a new set of virtues. I think that in fact, there's an ideal of a good society in back of left, right, and center, except for the extremes. And that that ideal is going to be incorporated mm -hmm. in a partisan way through ideology. You will never have us all sharing this whole thing, but we'll have us talking about it all the time. But I, I want to push back on that because I think I think a lot of the a lot of the you know, if you look at the polling, people thought that Trump was not a very honest or a or a, a public minded person when they voted for him, and that's the scandal, right? The the thought is, and and you, it doesn't have to be Trump in particular. You can apply it to whoever else you like. Um, the idea is that that um, virtue is, should be a criterion for high office. And it should also be what we try to promote in society rather than factional interest, rather than monetary benefit. Um, and this is true of, of technocratic liberals on the left as well as the right, that they want to measure the flourishing of the society based on how much money is in your pocketbook or how good you feel about things um, rather, than, rather than character. And I think that, that is the part of Republican, the Republican ideal that, that is lacking. I, not, I not, maybe, we, I, all of I our moral talk is virtue talk, of course. I agree with that. Yes. Okay. And so, and Trump, you're taking a poll that says polls are impossible to use as ways of judging how people think of, of leaders. But I'm sure that people thought that Trump, his supporters, that he has the virtue of telling the truth. And truthfulness is a virtue. It's, it's an important virtue. Well, isn't virtue or pretend virtue what essentially ends up creating the groups? Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, we can't try to find what's the true virtue. I mean, not if we stand back and look at the discourse uh, of a complex pluralistic society. Every group will claim that it has the right virtue. Right, but and, that's and what creates the group. Yeah, I agree totally, it is. But I think the good society is the, the, what, that's also what creates the aggression between the groups. 
because I think my virtue is better than your virtue, and therefore you are wrong, and so I can attack you. Yes, but if you want to see what is an operational definition of a better society, to me it's a more uh, incorporative one that allows more people the use of their full uh, life forces. That it, and, and I think that that's really what Trump, the right populists are a reaction against the expansion of the civil sphere in the United States. Uh, and so, Susan, I would... Be so I wouldn't be so depressed about this. I'm not, I don't, I think that these movements are reactions against progress and that we may be in store for another few years of a progressive movement, not a populist one. Okay. May, may, may I take a different approach perhaps? Uh, I, I like this discussion about virtue. Of course, we need that, we, we need tons of that. But thinking about our lives and about the future and about what we're going to do in the future, let's see what are the problems, first of all. I mean, what are the problems we face as humanity? Public health, epidemic, next epidemic, uh, the other one, the third one, etc. Oh, unfortunately, we got another. Secondly, economic inequality. I mean, migration and multiculturalism, fourth, I think. I mean, what do we do? I mean, with an ethos who happen to live in the same, in the same neighborhood. And finally, the survival of democracy. It is not evident that our democracies will survive forever. Now, my question is this. I, I, I will make two points, actually. First, I think that in all of those things, technocracy, technology is very crucial in all of those things. And I think that populists are very much inimical to technology and technocracy. It is the elite after all, okay? We don't like the elites because we're populists, but it so happens that among the elites, most of the technocrats from Bill Gates to you know the universities where all of you teach in the United States, you are very fond of technocracy and technology, and populists don't like that. So we have to do something about it. So populists do not play a positive role. And my second point is that populists cannot solve any of those big problems, apparently, except or theoretically, except inequality. But do they have the means? Do they have the policies? Do they have the agenda to solve social or economic inequality? No. So I will leave it here by saying that liberal democracy is the only and better solution that we have, and we have to improve the institutions of our liberal democracies. And this is the stance I will take in this discussion. Maybe the panelists could respond to the Fishbein uh, question that's on yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out uh, for you. So the first one Scott wrote, thank you, Scott, for writing these questions. The first one he wrote was, what do the panelists think about the idea of popular and communitarian thought? And again, after Trump, that the rise of right wing populist movements in the United States is a result of a hollowing out of America's civil society and engagement in local politics. Is a big part of left and right wing populism some sort of illusion of national engagement in politics that replaces the vital role of engagement in community life in societies? What about a second question? Uh, and then the second one, <clears throat> excuse me. It seems that all right wing populism is immediately labeled fascism by the left media and all left wing populism is immediately labeled socialism by the right wing media. And that ultimately, this prevents any real engagement for the country with the very real problems that generate these movements and give demagogues like Trump a platform. How can we engage with people's outrage in a more constructive way than populism or labeling people's grievances as politically radical and therefore invalid? I think I'll just say briefly, I really like that second point. I think it's very... <laughs> It's really fascinating and important, which is that populism tends to be a label of 
denigration often used to undermine the, the valid dimension of massive social movements. Uh, we are right to be very worried about the dem anti-democratic dimensions as Takis has talked about throughout. At the same time, we I think we want to respond to Trumpism by saying it reveals, as uh, Don and Jay has talked about, the underlying displacement of masses of, of Americans economically. Um, so I think that's a, a good point that, you know, populism is is a label that is right to use in a sense to pollute the anti-democratic and demagogic aspect, but yet usually populism responds to deep fractures that need to be repaired in a society. I mean, I, I think, you know, one, one thing we can think about is sort of what is, what is government for and uh, what are the limits of what government can achieve and you know, what, 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 are, what are political movements for? And um, when I think about economic issues or issues of distributive justice or even issues of access to certain kinds of institutions, those seem like places where you know, uh, government can do something and ought to do something. Um, but if the grievances are related to um, there are too many brown people in my neighborhood, I don't think that's something the government should be in the business of doing quite the opposite, right? Um, so. You know, I, I, politics of grievance can be politics of legitimate grievance or illegitimate grievance, and we have to hold the line on, you know, we have a multicultural, a plural society. I'm an immigrant, a legal immigrant, and a naturalized <laughs> citizen of this country. And I've also immigrated to other countries. I, I, I spent some years living in the UK, and, um, and I think that's, that's been central to the kind of um, American experiment, the American national ideology, and politicians of all stripes should, should agree with that. Um, but, you know, we can also say that these kinds of uh, grievance politics are exacerbated by certain kinds of economic phenomena, and uh, you can you can you don't have to respond directly to people's feelings, um, but you can respond to what their feelings might be driven by if you think that's a legitimate site for government intervi intervention in a problem of distributive justice or a problem of of uh, equality and rights. And you know, again, going uh, not to, to sort of uh, jump on the Republican hobby horse too much, but you know, solidarity is also a word that's kind of dropped out of our politics. The, the fraternite element of uh, you know our Republican imagination, and uh, I think there ought to be a bigger space for for solidarity, um, not just you know solidarity among say the, the working class or anything like that but solidarity across class divisions, across racial divisions. And, and this is really central and, and needs to be restored to our, our politics too. And that's, a, you know, insofar as we think of populism as a bad thing, you know, that, I think part of the appropriate response also has to be building a culture of solidarity. Well, I would say that um, populism can be redeemed, if you will. It is not always bad. Uh, if it embraces a, a coalition building ethos uh, that says let's reach out to uh, other aggrieved people who don't look exactly like us and let's uh, build, a, build a movement, uh, then populism can be a very good thing. I, I go so far as to say that populism created liberal democracy from the 18th century forward. It's not automatically an opposite force that um, we have to choose either or. Uh, instead, uh, we, need, we need desperately to have a populist element in liberal democracy, and we need it to have a, a coalition building um, ethos to it. Uh, that's how you, you get things done in, the, in a majority-based political system. And, and I, well, what about going back to Takas's first point about illiberal democracy being a definition but, um, in that, that there are but, certain but, virtues associated associated with illiberalism. They're actually they, what they call what these folks who pr promote it call their virtues. And it's interesting to think, well, what are those and how might we uh, neutralize them or engage them in a way that's more constructive? Can you be more specific about the virtues of illiberal democracy? Well, let's see. So if, I, I could, one comes to mind, 
uh, if the elites are overly educated and they're eggheads, they don't really know how the, the plain folk, what they experience, what they do. Um, there's mm -hmm. this uh, there's this virtue, which is we don't listen to experts, right? In fact, listening to experts is considered a negative virtue, right? So that would be an example of what I mean. Also, I, mean, I, that I think that there's such a thing as impartiality or that anyone might strive towards impartiality. I was, I've made this comment several times that, you know, Trump made a comment about there, there are Republican judges and there are Democratic judges. And uh, Justice Roberts said, oh no, no, they're not. And Trump said, well, of course they are, you know, you're being a chump. And uh, I- He was know. willing to speak the truth on that occasion. Of course, yeah, we, we, have a, we, have a, we have a, we have a, we have a lifetime appointment super legislature that yeah. runs, that runs large parts of our, our public life. Of course well, we do. Just, Every well, they, single political scientist would tell you that. Right. But wait, but wait, okay, but yes, if people on the right and if people on the left both seem to endorse that claim of Trump's, which I would say is unfortunate in this sense that it's it's uh, not prescriptive of the democratic spirit, right? Because judges do think they're being impartial and we have ways of discerning people who tend to be impartial or deliberative in their judgments and people who are not. And I think everyone can recognize that or usually can. And it's an important virtue that I don't hear trumpeted very much, and not to use uh, a clang term. But, but just on the problem, the, the point. This notion of, of impartiality. I mean, one issue we haven't spoken about is nationalism versus cosmopolitanism. That's a, a different version, of, but it's, it's complementary to what you're saying. And illiberal politics uh, are usually highly nationalistic and explicitly anti-cosmopolitan, which they associate cosmopolitanism with intellectuals, Jews, uh, and, and uh, you know, other people like bankers, et cetera. Just can I, can I go back to Jerry's point about expertise? Because I think this is really interesting. Um, I mean, I, I think listening to experts, you, you framed it very carefully. Listening to experts is a, a good thing, we might think, because there are problems that arise in complex political societies that require expertise to, to address them. But rule by experts is bad, anti-democratic and inappropriate. Um, you know, I, and I, that, that, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strain of anti-democracy on the technocratic left, just as there is on the, uh, you know, the kind of um, hyper-nationalist or hyper-populist right, which wants to exclude people from voter rolls and, and things like that. Um, and you know, one way of being anti-democratic is being technocratic, too technocratic, and saying, um, I, I think a great example of this is, in, you know, in the current pandemic, um, we've, we've had this kind of polarized response to public health guidance um, that uh, either wants to say, well, public health experts are the right people to, to make these political decisions on our behalf. You know, Anthony Fauci should decide whether we should shut down or not, which fails to recognize that there's lo there are lots of goals uh, political goals that we have in a public health crisis that have to be balanced against each other. And I think this is, this comes out most clearly in the conversation about school closures. Like even after it's been, you know, it seems like schools can be reopened pretty safely, it's become a kind of principle in certain corners of the left uh, in, in our uh, kind of current political system to say, no, the schools have to stay shut, um, which ignores the massive inequality that this drives when you think about the, the radically higher effects of school closures on poorer and minority children. And, you know, so I think, I think, you know, thinking, just realizing that there's no such thing as political expertise, um, that there's only political wisdom, uh, which is to say there is a, a sense of the different kinds of goals that we're trying to pursue uh, on behalf of all of us. And we have Im a set of imperfect people who are sufficiently different from each other who are going to deliberate and figure this out. But they're not, they're not experts in anything. They should listen to experts insofar as expert knowledge is, is, is relevant and available. And of course, saying you never listen to experts is just as foolish as saying always listen to experts. But I think there's actually there's a deeper truth that we can that is not a nonpartisan truth about about the nature of politics that we can we can get to here just by careful reflection on what it is that we're doing when we're deliberating together. I think one of the things that gives expertise a bad name is that experts claim their authority on universal characteristics. They would say um, we know the scientific truth and that's good for everybody and we sort of insist that it, it uh, go down um, when in fact uh, they're advocating a set of policies that benefit a very narrow 
slice of the population. Uh, so when experts claim to be to have universal validity, but actually are being very selfish, then that's a perfect ticket for getting discredited uh, on the, on the populist level. Uh, so uh, I think one of the reasons, one of the things that sets off populist movements is that the elites really have failed the people. And uh, that means that if um, information-based elites, that is experts, uh, want to retain um, the respect of the public, and they've got to kind of keep doing a gut check about whether their advice is um, truly beneficial for people at large uh, or only a, a, a fraction. Well, last century uh, in his uh, public opinion, uh, Walter Lippmann had written about the use of stereotypes as a, a potent force in, in, dri in driving public opinion, how much they repressed ideas as much as they put forward ideas, which is an interestingly psychoanalytic way of looking at stereotypes. Um, but I, I would say that the issue about, let's say, experts and expertise is that in this information uh, marketplace, uh, some of these stereotypes end up acting as tokens and the sort of subtleties that you just, both of you just expressed about expertise, which is wonderful and should be out there, ends up being uh, repressed, pushed away because of the effect of these stereotypes. Okay. Uh, how many uh, um, How many more questions are we feeling? Sorry, just because there's one on YouTube and I have one myself, but I don't want to uh, abuse my position as a Q&A moderator. Uh, so if that if that's kosher, so there's one on YouTube and then I could give mine if that's okay with all of you. Otherwise, I'll just do the one on YouTube. What's... No, no, you can do, do you both. Can... Okay, okay. Do both. Okay, so, um, so the one on YouTube is from Robert Price. Thank you, Robert. So Robert wrote, what is the balance between identity versus issue or virtue with regard to intensity of emotions? Are different orders of passion generated by identity and issues or virtues? I mean, just I just like to say that a lot of uh, can, can I, uh, well, let me let me try. Wait, hold on, Takas. We got a little delay here. Go ahead, Jeff. Why don't you go first, and then we'll take you, Takas. I think that's a good question because a lot of the fear of populism is the fear of emotions in politics as endangering supposedly the virtue of deliberative uh, rationality um, and. I, I don't agree with that. I think that sociologically, mass movements are emotional. And in that sense, they all engage in stereotypes. They engage in, in passion and non-rational behavior. That, may, that gives them, if you, if you want to start from every uh, the center, yes, it gives them a dimension of populism, but it doesn't make them anti-democratic. Uh, well, more or less what Jeffrey said, but from a slightly different perspective, I do not understand why mass movements are emotional. I think they are rational to a very large extent, but let us not argue about that. Uh, I, I think that, again, going trying to answer both questions, I was listening to you earlier, guys, I mean, talking about perhaps populist might be a good thing and populist created liberalism and, you know, a critique to technocracy. And I was thinking from my little place in Europe, because I'm in Europe, that if I remember well, you had an election a few months ago in the United States and the whole society became very much polarized about those issues. The role of emotions, the role of technology, what do we do with, you know, COVID-19? How do we face that? And you know, rationality, uh, technocracy, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, did you forget about that? Uh, <laughs> so populism was not a good thing. And this is why the American people voted for, you know, a different administration, a non-populist one, because that was the issue. I mean, illiberalism versus liberalism. Now, the interesting thing here is that emotions versus rationality. 
populism is always about words, about ethos, about uh, emotions, about resentment, resentment, vindictiveness. Those are crucial feelings behind the rise of populist movements. On the other hand, you have rationality, problem solving, making positive sum games, not zero sum games. How to build positive sum games? This is not the game of populism. This is the game of liberalism. Okay? So that is the, the thing that has the balance that has to be achieved in our societies. I mean, how much emotion? How much rationality? What do we want? How do we, what do we prefer? What do we choose when, you know, the chips go down? Like now with COVID, for example. So that is, you, that is very you're important. You're describing this as and emotions that versus rationality. Well, it, it seems to me- No, 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 they go together, This is another course. example, we have, Chuck, is we, we of the importance beings. of a long-term perspective because uh, populism was part of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, populism uh, was uh, throughout the Arab Spring. That didn't work out as well as uh, it should have. But uh, populism is part of the legacy of the American and French revolutions, and that ultimately strengthens liberal democracy. Uh, populism can, can be um, a, an enormously liberating thing in uh, the proper context. Uh, and so that's why I'd like to keep um, uh, a window open to the, the positive uh, aspects of populism, uh, because in the long, in the historical long run, there, it has been very important. To my, to my way of thinking, anyway. That is fully legitimate, Harry. I understand, I, I understand that, of course. But I don't forget that there was a populist president in your country a few months ago. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, well, uh, I think that's a perfect example. Or I, I think our, the, the remarks you've made and the remarks I've made are good examples of the way that uh, populism has, in, in effect, uh, uh, a two-faced character. It, it can uh, be beneficial and it can be very harmful. Um, and, it, you know, like, like so many other things, uh, it, it needs to be deployed um, properly. Alex, you want to... Yeah, Alex fire away with your question? Yeah, um, so I kind of want to put the mirrors onto the populist leaders. So what do you think about this statement? Uh, pop, the, the populism that we see, especially amongst Trump and the other leaders you mentioned is, is a reflection of their own incompetence and sadism and incompetence being even emotional incompetence. And so I've heard references to Venezuela and then some of Modi's uh, failed policies in India, like with the land reform. And I think the demonetization, that was a complete catastrophe. But I also thought of a, a funnier example. I think it's also uh, rather telling is the um, MEP, so the member of European Parliament from Hungary. I can't. I don't want to pronounce his name because I, I'm not going to get it right. But he wrote the Constitution of Hungary that current Hungary currently has on his iPad. He uh, made uh, gay marriage illegal, and he was found in Belgium uh, at a orgy amongst like 20 other men during the lockdown with uh, ecstasy on him. And so he's like, oh, that's not mine. But point is like, you know, uh, that's I, I, the other reason I came up with this besides that funny story is that uh, in Hayek, Friedrich Hayek's wrote the serfdom. When he looks back on the collectivism amongst Nazism, Italian fascism and uh, USSR communism, that you have these characters who really exact really brutal, like this brutalism amongst the people. And you really sort of wonder what would these people be doing if they didn't live in these societies in this way? Like, would they have this political power? And then lastly, to bring it more modern, if you look at the distinction in immigration policy between Trump and Obama, they did similar things. Obama deported, I think, more people than Trump did. And a lot of the pictures of kids in cages were also during Obama. I, I think Obama was better in general. I'm not, I'm just saying like, what, what uh, I guess, yeah. So what line do we draw between like uh, this incompetence and sadism seen amongst these populist leaders? versus I guess what we see with leaders that we're saying are normal or, you know, fit the mold that are, are not populist. I mean, I think there's definitely a dimension to which you know, some of these differences are, are about language, about the kind of form of political communication and 
um, I mean, I'm, I'm always very interested in what the actual material impact of people's policies are uh, rather than in the way they talk. But you have to admit that, you know, the, the way that, that, that politicians and leaders talk does have an effect on the limits of acceptable discourse, on uh, the demonization of minorities in particular. I mean, I think, um, I think especially if you look at the, um, the corruption that has come hand in hand with, with uh, populist leaders all over the map, you know, the kind of patronage politics or cronyism, that, you know, those, are, those are very material impacts that you can see, like are contracts going to the friends of this charismatic leader or not? Uh, so that, that those kinds of very concrete authoritarian tendencies, uh, I think, are are important to keep in mind. Um, uh, incompetence, I think that, that's interesting. Um, I mean, the tendency is for populist leaders to come in from the outside, but not always, right? Modi is a good example. He was a uh, sort of normal part of of uh, BJP politics for a very long time before he came to power. And it was only because he was stained from, from the 2002 scandal in Gujarat, the sectarian violence there, that he, he, he had to wait his time uh, before he could, he could uh, successfully run um, for higher office. And he did. You know, he was kind of forgiven by the elite in, in various ways for, for his role in that. And um, <clears throat> you know, I think some of, some of his uh, trade policies and, and international development policies and infrastructure policies have, have worked, and some of them have been, have been disastrous. Uh, but you know, the, I think the lasting legacy is not going to be sort of the normal politics, but rather the the demonization of Muslims, the reconstruction of India not as a secular but as a Hindu country. And if we think about Trump and his effect, we we have an, a kind of nationalist strain, a xenophobic strain in our politics that has has not succeeded before post World War II. I mean, other people have had this strain. Uh, you know, think about Pat Buchanan and, and various other people who have been sort of openly nationalistic. But you can just sort of say white nationalist things as a normal member of the Republican Party, especially at the local level, and that's seen as acceptable, and that's a change from the top. So I think I think that's the kind of that's that's the, the worrisome legacy outlasting any of the, the incompetence or the competence of particular economic or tax policy or whatever else you've got. Okay. Uh, well, Alex, uh, what do you mean by incompetent? Can I? Can yeah, I well, yeah, because I, yeah, because even sort of saw this with because, the, yeah, I, I, yeah, just to, sorry, just to clarify, because you know, with the with the people who stormed the Michigan State House, and then even the people who stormed the the Capitol building on June January sixth. There was this idea that they were LARPing, like they're live action role playing. And so this idea that they're enacting a fantasy. And then in a way, when people talk about even Trump and some of the policies he did, a lot of the time you're like, what, you know, what, like, why, why is he hiring these people who are obviously not good at their jobs? Like he's not good at his job to pick competent people. So that's what I meant by, I guess, incompetence in that way. And I guess even mentally or emotional incompetence would be with the, with the, you know, talking about the guy from Hungary, obviously having maybe being closeted and then enacting <laughs> and then creating a constitution that doesn't allow, uh, you know, civil rights to uh, gay and lesbian couples. So I guess that's, it's, yeah, it's not the most concise definition of incompetence, but that's sort of what I'm just yeah, uh, towards. Because, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the Hungarian guy, I mean, this happened here in my neighborhood, by the way, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Uh, he, he was, you know, he was a creep. I mean, he went to that orgy and he was caught and he tried to uh, to escape the police. He, 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 he was taken to the police station, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's, 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 okay. He was a hypocrite anyways. I mean, he's one of the uh, stooges of Orban in Budapest. But th that's not the point. The point is that populist leaders, when they come to power, they have proven their competence. Okay, they are strong, charismatic leaders. In most of the cases, they create from scratch their own parties, like Chavez, like Orban himself, by the way, like Berlusconi, or they take over parties created by others, like your Trump, for example, right? Or Peron, he created his own party. Alberto Fujimori in Peru created his own party. Rafael Correa in Ecuador. So those are important, strong people with great you know, blunt ideas about the future. And they apply radical uh, uh, policies. Now, 
They may be competent in implementing their policies. I don't disagree with that, of course, but they are very charismatic leaders in all the cases. There is not any case of charismatic leadership that I know, again, in power that uh, has not had previously a charismatic leader. So it is, that's a fact. Yeah. All right. Well, I think um, we should, as, as much as I'd like to hear this go on, this has been a wonderful conversation. I would say is incredible. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. I want to, again, thank our, our participants for such a lively uh, conversation and our audience too for uh, their, their participation and their listening. Um, again, we're going to be reconvening uh, on, um, uh, what was the date I gave you? Uh, March 20th for the um, a placebo roundtable and uh, further information to follow on our website. Thank you again, gentlemen, and uh, have a great, great day and good weekend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Thanks. Great. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Enjoyed it.